near and far. I think space has a very different uh, meaning nowadays as we're all on Zoom. Uh, we are, I want to welcome you back to our ongoing series here at Harvard Hillel, uh, hearing from notable Harvard scholars on uh, issues related to their fields of expertise and coronavirus. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, give the floor over to Rebecca Aritan, who is our undergraduate student president, who has a very quick and brief announcement. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, I'm so excited to hear from Professor Pinker. Um, I can imagine that many of us have heard a lot about the coronavirus plague. So I'm inviting anyone who wants to take a break from thinking about this plague and think about the 10 original plagues. Um, you're, you're invited to um, an event that's happening immediately at 8.30 p.m. It's going to be matzo pizza making and um, a screening of the Prince of Egypt for undergraduates. So I'll send for that event. Hopefully, I'll see those of you who are event. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. She did cut out there briefly, but for undergrads only, there is a matzo pizza making event and a uh, streaming of the movie Prince of Egypt. Uh, I'll, uh, you'll see emails in your inbox if you're an undergrad uh, with the link to that event. Uh, but I would like to welcome now Professor Steven Pinker. Uh, Professor Pinker is an experimental psychologist who conducts research in visual cognition, psycholinguistics, and social relations. He is currently the John Stone Professor of Psychology at Harvard. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, a humanist of the year, and Times 100 most influential people in the world today. He has won numerous prizes for his research, his teaching, and his 10 books, including The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and most recently, Enlightenment Now, the Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Professor Pinker, it is a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thanks very much. Um, I just would uh, like to begin. Uh, it is uh, Passover. Um, I know you come from the Montreal Jewish community, a community which has produced uh, many interesting people, including yourself and Leonard Cohen, I believe Saul Bellow also as well. Uh, would you mind spending just a minute or two talking a little bit about your own Jewish background coming from there, maybe the influence uh, it's played uh, on your life. Yes, um, Montreal's Jewish community is a minority within a minority within a minority within a minority. Uh, within Canada, uh, I grew up in the province of Quebec, a French minority within the country of Canada, then there was the Anglophone minority in Quebec and the Jewish minority within the Anglophone minority, although there were Francophone Jews as well. Uh, I uh, went to um, uh, secular public schools, but uh, I went to Hebrew school and, and Sunday school. I later became a Sunday school teacher at the at our uh, Reform Temple. Uh, I went to a high school that was probably that was uh, probably ninety five percent Jewish, just because of voluntary uh, residential segregation. I grew up uh, next to a suburb where the uh, the, the, the uh, Jews who made it into the lower middle class congregated. So uh, m many of my classmates could could uh, speak Yiddish just because they, their uh, parents and grandparents did. There was a, a, a strong uh, Jewish identity. After the uh, stirrings of the separatist movement, there was, a, if you'll pardon the expression, something of an exodus of uh, Anglophone Jews from Quebec to, to uh, Toronto, but it has stopped and the community, uh, Jewish community in Montreal continues to be uh, vibrant and, um, uh, and, uh, and diverse because it also welcomes Francophone Jews, many um, uh, from the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Uh, I was taught French in school by uh, Egyptian and Moroccan and Tunisian Jews because the public schools in Quebec were segregated by religion uh, into uh, Catholic and Protestant. Protestant basically meant un-Catholic, so it included the Jews. And uh, Catholics couldn't teach in the Protestant public schools. It's bizarre by American standards that religion would be so woven into the public education system, but so it was. And I learned French from, uh, uh, not from Quebecois francophones because they were Catholic and uh, could not be hired, but from uh, Moroccan and Tunisian Jews. Uh, wonderful, thank you. I think you also told me that um, your mother had been in Hebrew school with Leonard Cohen, is that correct? 
Uh, that is right. She's in Sunday School of Medicon. I believe she might be uh, watching. For, uh, yeah, I think her name is Rosalind, and I think she is on the call, so we welcome her uh, uh, as well. Uh, yes, well, it, uh, she and, and uh, Leonard Cohn were um, in the same Sunday School class. Uh, when uh, Leonard Cohn passed away a couple of years ago, one of the photographs that circulated on, on news sites showed him as a 13-year-old, uh, and there was a uh, pretty girl towering over him uh, at the Shara Shemayim. I had a uh, 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 Sunday school class, and that, that was uh, Ron's, uh, mine, Rose Weisenfeld, my mother, uh -huh. speaker. Um, very interesting. I want to begin maybe with a, a broad question. If you could talk a little bit about what a pandemic is, uh, and in your mind, what do you think are, are the best ways that we should be uh, addressing this situation? Uh, it, it begins with, with realizing that, that uh, pandemics are woven into the nature of life. Uh, we aren't the first to ponder why pandemics should occur. Well, of course, we are uh, speaking during the week of Pesach, where uh, a uh, plague was given divine meaning in terms of uh, coercion uh, of the, the uh, Pharaoh. And of course, in the Christian Bible, uh, um, plague is one of the four horsemen of the uh, apocalypse and had eschatological meaning in bringing about the, the end of days. Uh, now we have a, a better understanding of why there are pa pandemics, not as a divine coercion, uh, but it is very much woven into the nature of life because life consists of systems that capture energy and raw materials from the environment and then reproduce. Organisms are opportunistic. They don't leave the equivalent of $100 bills lying on the sidewalk. And uh, you and I are, are kind of $100 bills lying on the sidewalk, or to, to change the metaphor, we're you know, big yummy mounds of gingerbread there, there for the eating. And we're irresistible to uh, itty bitty organisms that can infiltrate us from the inside, particularly viruses for whom we're not just um, gingerbread, I think partly the, uh, uh, the reference to uh, Hametz on, uh, on, on uh, Pesach, um, but we're bakeries. We have all the machinery necessary to, to replicate things, uh, including them and when they commandeer our um, reproductive uh, cellular reproductive machinery to make more copies of, uh, of those very viruses. So the question arises, how come we're not dead, uh, given that viruses and other pathogens, bacteria, uh, fungi, um, uh, single-celled organisms, reproduce so much faster than us that they can uh, kind of out, out of all of us. But uh, uh, Stein's law says what can't go on forever doesn't. And uh, we're not all dead because it's in the very nature of evolution for organisms to fight back. And we fight back in a number of ways. We um, have an immune system, of course. Uh, we reproduce sexually. One of the leading theories as to why organisms go to the bother of having uh, males and sex, where a uh, single sex, uh, females that just reproduced parthenogenetically would pump out twice as many babies. And, but one of the answers is that the disadvantages They'd all be clones. They'd be sitting ducks to any pathogen that um, evolved to kind of pick the locks and keys of the cellular machinery. By um, having babies who are not clones, we uh, change the combination every generation. And that's one of the, the major theories of why sex evolved. Now, when it comes to humans, we have uh, yet another arsenal of weapons to fight back. One that's rather primitive is sometimes called the behavioral immune system. Uh, these are emotions that get activated by the sight or the thought of disease vectors. Uh, we tend to become a little more introverted when we're sick or when we uh, are in the presence of illness, so we, we don't uh, go out and about as much. Uh, we tend to be a little more xenophobic, which is a, a, a tragic side of our behavioral immune system. We stay away from uh, people who are not, not like us. Um, and we have an emotion, the emotion of disgust. The, uh, we are grossed out by pretty much the same things that epidemiologists tell us are disease vectors. Slimy secretions from uh, bodies, um, breath, um, bodily effluvia, um, little organisms like um, uh, slugs and snails and fleas and, and uh, uh, rats, the kind of things that give us the willies also happen to be the kinds of things that tend to uh, allow pathogens to hitch a ride from one organism to another. Now, we, now we humans now have uh, a third weapon, and that is uh, our intelligence, our, our cognitive processes, our reason. And we, uh, it took a while, but we came up with the germ theory of disease. So we know that illness isn't caused by, uh, by, by miasmas, by, by uh, malodorous swamps, uh, but, but rather by 
itty bitty uh, organisms. Uh, and of course, we fight back with uh, vaccination by beefing up our immune systems with uh, drugs, such as antiviral drugs, and of course, with uh, public health measures such as uh, coughing into your elbow and staying six feet away and uh, sheltering in place. Now, given that, I'll, I'll mention one other thing in, in this long winded answer to your short question, because uh, I think you also uh, were asking not just. Uh, why are there plagues? Uh, how should we think about them? What, what do plagues have to do with, with the uh, human condition, at least in, in the modern scientific understanding uh, in which they're no longer uh, divine retribution. Uh, but it, uh, given how disease is woven into life, woven into our, 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 our sexuality, our, our, our immune system, given that a look at history shows that there have been horrendous plagues throughout uh, recorded history, um, the, uh, the Black Death, which may have killed up to half of Europe, the, uh, of course, the, the horrendous uh, transmission of disease to the New World, which resulted in the uh, um, massive death of uh, Indigenous Americans, the um, Spanish Flu, which killed far more people than, than uh, World War I. I mean, they have, it's part of life. And um, a puzzle is why don't we have the equivalent of, um, you know, a, a fire department. Why don't we have infrastructure sitting and waiting? And you know, just like fire uh, firefighters spend a lot of their time, uh, you know, patting their Dalm Dalmatians and playing cards uh, before they slide down the brass pole. Uh, but but we have them, and and uh, they've been so successful that most fire departments um, rarely put out fires. They break down doors when people have heart attacks. Uh, they respond to medical emergencies, but they're kind of putting themselves uh, out of a job, fortunately. Uh, the puzzle is why the world doesn't have an epidemiological uh, fire department, namely networks of um, uh, early reporting and monitoring, the uh, infrastructure to uh, develop vaccines and produce vaccines quickly on, on a short notice to develop antiviral drugs, um, stockpiles of personal protective equipment, uh, just as puzzling is why, given that we have this emergency has fallen upon us uh, pretty suddenly and extremely, why we didn't have a, a reaction uh, like we did after 9-11, where an entire federal bureaucracy, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, popped up almost overnight. Uh, our, our habits changed, uh, uh, obsessive checking of ID cards, and you can't get within 100 feet of a federal building and uh, airline security changed, but uh, very little has changed, uh, at least permanently, as a result of something that uh, we know can happen anytime. And unlike a response to terrorism, where there really are um, cognitive biases and uh, illusions at work, because terrorism kills very few people. Um, more people die from allergic reactions to bee stings than from terrorism. Nonetheless, we fought two wars, set up a huge federal infrastructure, for a fairly, um, every, every death is a tragedy, but there just aren't that many when it comes to terrorism. 9-11 was uh, off the scale of most terrorist attacks, uh, at least outside of war zones, uh, are really minor risks to life and limb. But of course they are designed to, to capitalize on our uh, fear reaction. That's why it's called terrorism. Uh, pandemics in contrast, though a lot of them uh, don't kill a lot, of, or I should say epidemics. A lot of them don't kill a lot of people. Uh, they they uh, peter out after uh, killing a thousand people or so. But um, pandemics uh, uh, or epidemics in general fall into what's called a, a thick-tailed distribution. That is, most of them uh, don't kill a lot of people, but some of them kill a, a stupendous number of people. That the thick tail refers to the um, uh, end of the distribution, where unlike distributions like uh, bell curves, normal distributions, where it uh, approaches the floor very, very quickly, a thick tail distribution has lot has a not lots, but a non negligible number of very, very large events, uh, like the Spanish flu, like the uh, HIV uh, AIDS pandemic. Um, COVID nineteen hasn't got there yet, but the thing about pandemics is. Uh, they could, because one of their generators, namely exponential growth, one person infects two, two infect four, four infect eight, and so on. 
uh, can uh, can grow to any size uh, quickly if it isn't beaten back by our immune response, beefed up by vaccinations and by mechanisms of uh, hygiene and social distancing. Um, in, in your last two books, yeah, you take a very optimistic approach uh, to our current historical situation in general. Um, and some have critiqued you for that. I'm curious if uh, in light of coronavirus and our uh, political response to it, has that influenced or changed at all your perspective or your optimism? Well, no, because uh, Enlightenment Now and Better Angels of Our Nature were not books about optimism. This is a huge misunderstanding. They were books about facts, facts that people are ignorant of. No, almost no one knows, for example, that uh, extreme poverty has declined by 90% over the last uh, 200 years. Um, that's not optimistic. That's, that's a fact of which people are ignorant. Uh, and in fact, surveys show that people think that extreme poverty is increasing, not decreasing. People don't know that the rate of death in war has fallen by a factor of 20 since the late 40s, or early 50s. Uh, they, many people don't know that the murder rate and the rate of sexual assault in the United States has come down by between 50 and 70, uh, 75% over the past few decades. Now, reporting those facts is not optimistic. They're facts. Uh, it's not the, some people think the glass is half full and some people think the glass is half empty. It's people just don't know how much water there is in the glass in the first place. Um, so uh, uh, disease is, as I said, it's uh, a, um, a fact of life. Uh, the, the, the fact that we have succeeded in, in extending human lifespan from about 30 years to globally more than 70 years, in, in developed countries more than 80 years, uh, a, a lot of that is, comes from the fact that we have beaten back infectious disease in the past through vaccination, through sanitation. Uh, but we also know that um, the, the uh, curves of rising lifespan can take a big a big hit from through pandemics. The, the curve for the, of the 20th century of life expectancy shows a pretty substantial dip uh, in the first decades of the 20th century. But for, when I first glanced at that graph, I thought, oh my God, the, the, the tragedy of war, World War I actually reversed the uh, great expansion of, of uh, life, uh, longevity. Uh, it turns out I didn't read the graph carefully enough when I looked at more uh, closely at that dip. It was not 1914, 1918, it was 1918, 1990. That is the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, so pandemics can take a big, big hit. Fortunately, we do have means of combating them. Uh, it's unlikely that uh, as with the plague of Justinian, as with the um, Black Death, as with the uh, decimation of the uh, Native Americans that we're gonna see 40, 50, 90% of the population killed. Um, we are, at, at, it, it is a tragedy. We don't know how bad a tragedy is gonna be. It's probably not gonna be that bad, thanks to the fact that we have mustered the uh, powers of reason and the tools to fight back against nature, which is constantly uh, eating, up, eating away at us. Uh, some have argued that this actually is more of a dress rehearsal for potentially a much worse uh, pandemic. Um, so I guess I'm curious in terms of our general political response, which uh, at least in this country, uh, many have said uh, could, could have been a lot swifter. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, had this particular uh, pandemic been worse in terms of its own nature of, of its spread and its lethality, uh, that actually could have been much worse. So I guess, do you think that having now going through the experience of coronavirus as we are today, is that gonna prepare us ultimately better? Do you have a, a sanguine um, I guess, prediction on, on going forward? Well, it, it, it should prepare us better. We should have been better prepared for this one, given that you know, pandemics are part of life. Um, the, uh, and, and there could be worse ones. That is, uh, the, 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 the fact that we've made progress uh, is a, a dividend of the application of reason in the past in, uh, <clears throat> in public health, in, uh, in medicine, in uh, basic biology, uh, but there's no, there, there's no general force that makes things come out okay. Uh, if we apply our kind of collective ingenuity and our, our uh, collective uh, resolve to uh, push back against disease, then we can gradually make progress. And if, and if we don't, we won't, but the threat will, all, will, uh, will always be there. Um, I, I hope that since the, dis since, um, even when people react too late, uh, certain things do get their attention. 9-11 uh, got, the got 
Americans' attention. This is certainly getting Americans' attention. Uh, what ought to happen is a, um, a much more proactive um, infrastructure to, to fight disease, a kind of the equivalent of a fire department or a Department of Homeland Security. With the current administration, it's um, uh, you know anyone's guess as to whether the rational uh, response will actually will be the actual response. Uh, probably not. Uh, let's hope within, within if not, let's hope for the next administration. And like, by the way, I will mention one other uh, aspect of this problem, which of course is that it's global. Uh, viruses don't care about national borders. Uh, the there should have been more global cooperation earlier on. We need global cooperation now because no single country can uh, fight it on its own. And uh, again, a rational response would be to strengthen the uh, global institutions uh, that. Um, that, that uh, track uh, pandemics before their pandemics and that share expertise and, uh, and know-how. It, it seems to me that one of the obstacles to a, a swifter, more robust response to coronavirus has been um, a distrust of the scientific and medical communities uh, and experts that we see among large swaths of society and even amongst some of the political establishment. How do you think uh, we could combat this? Is this a problem uh, of language or framing? And if so, how would you counsel health professionals to better convey their recommendations? Well, it, it is it, a lot of the rejection of uh, science, um, not just in public health measures, but in uh, denial of uh, anthropogenic climate change, denial of uh, evolution. Um, denial of uh, vaccine safety, denial of the safety of genetically modified organisms. Uh, research on why people believe weird things, conspiracy theories, why they, uh, Holocaust denial, chemtrails, the, the belief that, that, that those contrails that you see from planes in the sky are actually the federal government dispersing um, uh, uh, drugs to, uh, to uh, pacify us, us all in the atmosphere. Um, uh, very few of these beliefs actually correlate with what you'd expect, namely scientific literacy. It's not that if you know a lot of science, you're more uh, resistant to, uh, uh, to uh, weird beliefs and more accepting of the scientific consensus. Uh, a lot of it just it depends on political orientation. This is a problem that has probably gotten worse, but in the case of evolution and climate change, the best predictor is how far to the right or the left you are on, on the political spectrum. With the pandemic, uh, it started off following a similar gradient, uh, and, and still the extent to which people are following the public health measures of social distancing um, is strongly predicted by how far to the right or how far to the left they are. Uh, and given the narrative that uh, Donald Trump uh, originated when he was fearful that this would um, make him look bad, make the, the hit the stock market, which he takes credit for, uh, that it was all a, a, a democratic plot, a, a second impeachment. That has caught on uh, among, among certain segments of the American right, even as Trump has been forced by reality to back off that conspiracy theory. It's, it is a huge problem how we, uh, how the, what most of us would say is the, uh, the, 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 the clique, the tribe uh, with the best claim to objective understanding of the world, namely science, public health, medicine, um, how they can, how that can be better aligned with big political coalitions. Uh, given that very few of us know enough you know, virology, uh, epidemiology, to really, to genuinely understand how a pandemic happens and what stops it, we, we kind of trust the scientists. Um, not everyone does. We, just feel that those guys and, and women, we don't know, many of us don't know how they find what they find, but we have a meta awareness that they do have methods, techniques that will uh, lead toward or approach uh, truth as best as, as we can. How that awareness that, that, that there is a, uh, a set of methods, a set of techniques, a mindset toward finding uh, the truth, whatever it is, uh, so that people will, even if they can't follow, the experimental uh, methods and, and data will accept the results is, uh, I think, an open challenge for um, making society more rational. 
Uh, I have one follow-up question that I just want to say to the audience. Uh, if you have a question, there is a Q&A button you can press at the bottom uh, and type in your question there. Uh, Professor Pinker, you mentioned uh, just now that um, how one responds to the pandemic often has less to do with the amount of science that they know, but more of their political affiliation. Can you help sort of situate for us where that falls into cognitive theory of why someone uh, is, is drawn towards uh, their certain conclusions based on their political affiliation rather than uh, the science that they've been exposed to? Yeah, well, uh, you know, as I mentioned, most people don't even understand the science, even if they believe it. That it, if you give a test of climate literacy to people who accept uh, human-made climate change, um, uh, mo most of them uh, kind of flunk. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that the, uh, that, the, 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 the that hydrogen is a greenhouse gas, uh, that the way to deal with it is to close the ozone hole or clean up toxic waste dumps. They have kind of a general sense of kind of, you know, green versus pollution and assimilate climate change to, to that. But they are uh, sympathetic to credulous of the scientific uh, establishment. So even though their own grounds for believing in climate change aren't particularly rational, uh, fortunately, they support the right people and their beliefs accidentally are rational. Uh, but we have to realize that for most of us, most of us have a very shallow understanding of, uh, of the world around us. You ask people to explain how a zipper works, or how a toilet works, and uh, most people, they, they'll, they'll uh, mutter a few words and then they'll be uh, dumbfounded. They just, so much of our knowledge uh, is acquired vicariously. That's one of the reasons we have language. It's built into language that uh, some of the very meanings of our words hinge on our belief that there are experts out there who know. So a famous example from uh, uh, Harvard, late Harvard professor Hillary Putman, he confessed that he had no idea how to tell a, a beach from an elm. Uh, they're, they're, they're trees. But it's not that the words mean the same thing to him. He just knows there's someone out there, uh, arborists who know the difference, and that, that's good enough. Uh, for him. And it's indeed a lot of our knowledge, it's good enough if there are experts that we trust uh, that would, that, that can explain things, that can differentiate things. Uh, and we, we've seen our uh, society uh, start to fission into different trust and dis distrust groups. And the scientific consensus sadly is not among the, the uh, uh, trusted in groups in uh, certain segments, both, both on the right and, and on the left. The, uh, our, our current danger is that the segments on the right who reject science have an awful lot of political power. Uh, great, thank you so much. I, I wanna turn to some questions from the audience. So we have one from someone named Adam, no last name. How will people respond psychologically to quarantines? What are some ways to mitigate any potentially negative consequences of physical isolation? Well, what we're doing right now has a, a huge role to play. Uh, we are, uh, as important as it is to have face-to-face uh, -face contact, and it, it is important. My, uh, my sister, Susan Pinker, wrote a book called The Village Effect on the psychological and uh, indeed health benefits of face-to-face -face contact, a, a resource that, of course, is being sorely strained um, in the present moment. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, pixels and uh, waveforms are uh, are highly powerful. If you're if you're a human, we've uh, we're a species that has had um, epistolary romances and intellectual relationships and friendships, pen pals, uh, where it's just sharing of information has uh, even if it can't substitute for face to face contact, it has a um, a big effect. We we are we we are. Um, in form of ours, we, we eat information. And uh, we, one of the fortunate side effects of, of, uh, of technology, one of the things that makes this pandemic not as awful as it might have been, is the availability of platforms like, like uh, Zoom, particularly if they're used in ways that simulate uh, more intimate conversations. If it's not always several hundred people, but, but a couple of people, um, if there's, uh, if it's supplemented by um, but by gestures, by facial expressions. Uh, there's also a lot of variation depending on how fortunate people are in, in terms of whether they can um, get out and, uh, and enjoy nature and even their temperament. 
uh, introverts are uh, suffering much less than extroverts. Uh, thank you. It's also trying to curate here some of the questions. So um, we've got one from Rebecca Ayrton, who was on before, our, our student president. She asks, what is the role of compassion in times of crisis? Well, foremost, it's uh, our, our compassion ought to be mobilized to uh, preventing tragedies. Uh, we should uh, think that our, our actions, our failure to, uh, to act, uh, will will result in will result in, in uh, deaths, in suffering, in isolation, in poverty, uh, and so our we should do more than just feel compassion, as important as that is. Those of us who are in good health, those of us whose livelihoods have not been decimated by the uh, pandemic, should uh, be grateful for our good fortune. We should have compassion for those who are less fortunate, but more, even more important is we should support the measures that uh, would minimize the number of tragedies and the amount of suffering that, that there are. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to turn to Bracha Rosenberg. I believe she actually took uh, your class. She's a student of yours at some point. Uh, Bracha, we have uh, tried to make you a panelist here. Um, are you able to unmute yourself and turn on your video? There she Hi. is. Hi, Bracha. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. We can okay. see. Great. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I feel like it's interesting that this period of social distancing and isolation that we're all going through um, could provide some interesting grounds for future psychological research. It gives us a natural sample of people exposed to these conditions that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to ethically create and study. So are there any specific research questions that you're excited to pursue? At least one thing settled down. That's, that's a really good question. And uh, you know, if you are a social scientist, uh, since you can't treat the world as a, uh, uh, as a lab, you can't do randomized controlled trials uh, for every question that occurs to you, uh, you're absolutely right that um, although it's, it's, there is a ghoulish aspect to it, but economists and psychologists and sociologists do try to capitalize on these ex manipulations that the world throws at us. Uh, I should think more about it because it's a really good question, but what, uh, one question would be interesting to uh, look at is under what circumstances can digital uh, communication, digital intimacy, um, and in what forms provide some of the psychological benefits of face-to-face uh, -face contact? Uh, how does it interact with personality? Uh, does it have an effect on, on violence? There's some evidence that um, uh, street violence has gone down. Fewer uh, young men knifing each other in bars or, or shooting each other over parking spaces. Uh, but domestic violence may have increased as people are cooped up, get on uh, each other's nerves. Vulnerable uh, victims have uh, much more difficulty escaping to shelters. So what the effect of, uh, uh, on, on uh, violence would be. Contrary to uh, a, a, co a common belief that, that I come across, which is that in any time of social stress, violence will increase. Uh, that, that turns out to be a myth that there was um, no increase in the murder rate during the Spanish flu, which is the worst uh, in the 20th um. century. Uh, and um, during the Great Recession of uh, 07, 08, uh, there was no increase in the violence rate. In fact, it, uh, it decreased. So the effects of uh, great collective social stresses on violence are is an important question and one where at least so far um, it, it is not as bad as it, as it could be. But domestic violence might be a, a different story. Uh, great. Thank you so much. I want to turn, I've got a question from another undergraduate student, Kara Kupferman. Kara, can you uh, mute yourself and maybe turn on your video also? Hi. Hi Thank you for uh, calling on me. This is really exciting. Um, my question is about the all of the different virtual methods of connecting that we've come up with in the last month or so. Um, and you started touching on it in your response to Bracha's question. Um, but in your experience um, in the psychological literature, do you think that it is possible to get the same sort of benefits that we derive from face-to-face -face communication and connection from the virtual replacements that we've been creating in quarantine? 
Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And uh, here, the uh, another member of the family, Susan Pinker, might be better equipped to answer because she did write the book on it, The Village Effect. Uh, so we do know that in general, uh, uh, virtual contact is not as good as the real thing. Um, but, and uh, uh, Susan has written an uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal on the, the <coughs> making the best that we can of the media available to us. Uh, a lot of us, uh, even though certainly um, social media like uh, Facebook and other social media are uh, have advantages and disadvantages, but in general cannot substitute for real friendships. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have been using telephone for more than a century. Before that, we had uh, epistolary romances and friendships and, and letters and correspondence were uh, an enormous comfort to people in, uh, in the past as um, electronic communication is now. And the real-time video exchange with, with facial expressions, with tone of voice, with give and take um, uh, second by second, certainly is much more um, conducive to, to health and to warmth than, say, uh, posts on, uh, on, on Twitter or on Facebook. And uh, Susan did point out that the uh, in between, if, if one extreme would be posting on Facebook and another would be two people uh, in, in this same physical space, then uh, video conferencing, because it does have that give and take, it is, much, it is more human, more humane, uh, and, and might give us a lot of, uh, uh, of what we crave. Uh, thank you. I think we're going to move to uh, Adam Gilfix, a wonderful alum. Uh, Adam, it's nice to see you. If you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Great to see you as well. And thank you, Professor Pinker, for uh, taking the time to answer these questions and present this. Um, one thing I was curious about that we haven't touched too much upon yet is what kind of uh, personal privacy impacts might result medium to longer term as a result of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. Yeah, it's, it is a, it's a, an important question. I, I don't believe that every slope is slippery, uh, such that if we have more contact tracing, if we have uh, more um, enforcement of physical distancing, and notice, by the way, in, in connection to the conversation that we've just been having, uh, social distancing is a misnomer because we are, most of us are as social as ever, thanks to electronic media. Uh, the old-fashioned telephone as well as FaceTime and Zoom and, uh, and Skype and so on. It's physical distancing that we're enduring now. The, the key is that any uh, power that we cede to the government in this emergency ought to be demarcated with the circumstances in which it can apply so that we don't give a, um, a blank check to the government to uh, follow us, follow our contacts, but um, uh, as we already have in the case of um, the, uh, the, the Fourth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment and restrictions on government's ability to uh, do uh, searches and, and uh, seizures, and uh, that is build in legal safeguards at the same time as we give government certain powers, uh, overseen by uh, disinterested uh, third parties, say public health, um, um, experts or bodies that are not part of the political process. So I don't think it's, we necessarily have to worry about turning into a surveillance state, <clears throat> but we do have to worry about it enough to put in the right safeguards. Uh, thank you. I think we're gonna turn now to uh, another dear alum, Andrew Lobel. I'll also say uh, that when I first solicited some recommendations for scholars to come on to our series, uh, Andrew enthusiastically recommended you. So. Uh, Andrew, if you're there and able to uh, mute yourself and maybe uh, your video as well, go ahead. Sure. I apologize for the blurry video and thank you very much, Professor Pinker, for joining us tonight. I'm curious how this crisis and the self-quarantine that has come with it will either adversely or maybe even positively affect child development, particularly among young children. Yeah, so... Um... The, the biggest effect will be uh, the fact that children are being kept from peer groups. Um, I am a big uh, proponent of the idea that most of children's socialization takes place not from their parents, but, uh, but from their peers. 
uh, the most obvious case in, in uh, my, my knowledge base was, was language. Kids uh, pretty universally sound like their peers, not like their parents. When, when uh, uh, parents uh, emigrate and uh, uh, bring up their kids in a uh, environment in which either the accent is different from that of the parents or even the language is different, the parents will struggle with the uh, adopted language, kids will soak it up. The kids will sound like the uh, Alabamans or the Londons or the Bostonians that they grew up with. And that's probably true of taste in food and clothing and uh, political orientation and values. So the question is what happens when you have kids uh, cooped up with their parents all day? Uh, let, let's hope that it doesn't um, endure for the periods of time that, sh that uh, acculturate and socialize children. Uh, that would be a real experiment of nature that, that, uh, that I, I hope we don't have to uh, see the results of. But that, that would be one thing that in terms of, of lasting effect on children's personality and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and culture. Uh, in terms of the, the immediate effects, of course, there's the, uh, I think we should ask, what are the effects on, on uh, parents? Uh, there, we tend to think of parents now, nowadays as round the clock parenting machines and only ask about the welfare of children, but we should also be asking whether uh, parents are being driven crazy by the, the new responsibility uh, placed on them. But I think in general, if kids can get back to their peer groups, they'll, they'll do fine, kids are resilient. And do you think there will be a fear now that we live in a world where anyone one interacts with can be an asymptomatic carrier that children will be scared to socialize among peer groups when this is all over? Um, there, a lot depends on how long and how severe the, the um, pandemic lasts. Um, I think kids uh, change with changing uh, immediate circumstances pretty, um, uh, pretty swiftly, pretty, pretty skillfully. And so it's not as if the, uh, except for extreme effects of uh, abuse and trauma, um, uh, social environments aren't that sticky. When, when they change, kids can uh, change with them. Uh, so I, I don't think there'll be some lasting mark on their personality, leaving them more introverted, more disgusted, uh, more xenophobic over time because of this period that they have lived through. That, that would be my guess. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to move to Professor Ben Friedman, uh, another noted scholar at uh, Harvard and also a member of the Harvard Hillel Board. Uh, ben, go ahead. Hi, Ben. Uh, nice to see you, and uh, Ben and I are, uh, are, are good friends. Hi, Steve. First of all, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I'm curious to know to what extent you think religion is a major contributor to the distrust, disbelief in science that you've emphasized, and if you think that religion does, by which I mean, to be sure, some forms of religion, uh, play a major role in uh, this uh, pathology. Do you have anything to say about what the rest of society might do about it? Yeah, well, there, there are different answers to the question. One of them is that we, we certainly know that uh, religious assemblies have played a role, uh, an inadvertent role in uh, incubating and spreading uh, the virus. Uh, although, of course, that's not due to them, there being religions, it's due to there being uh, community organizations that bring lots of people together in, uh, in, in, in uh, closed in close spaces. Yeah, I, I was referring more to belief structures than, yeah. than behavioral patterns. Well, what is astonishing, I don't, no one has commented on this, but we've seen uh, probably for the first time in history, a massive emptying out of, uh, of, of ecclesiastical organizations. That is, people aren't going to church, people aren't going to shul, uh, because of science, because the public health experts say, uh, if you get together, then you'll spread disease. That is, the disease, it's not foul smelling air, it's not divine retribution, it's not the end of days, it's people um, getting close enough to spread germs. Everyone is listening to the, that science and staying out of houses, of houses of worship. So we're seeing actually a quite extraordinary dominance of science over religion in, in that sense. Uh, I do fear the, the, the uh, resistance to that. That is, there are uh, denominations, there are pockets where 
to distrust our sciences uh, strong enough um, that, uh, that people could, could resist it, thinking that God will take care of us in the long run. God wouldn't allow us to, uh, uh, to be felled by a, a virus, at least the virtuous among us, that it's a, a punishment, it's retribution, it's a, uh, an omen. Uh, to the extent that people believe that, then, then now we're in trouble. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another dear student, Twyla Cantor, has a question. Twyla, do you want to unmute yourself? And there you are, great. Hi, um, so I was wondering, some people are worried that if quarantine goes on too long, then prolonged self-isolation will have more widespread negative effects than coronavirus itself. So I'm wondering at what point do you think the cure becomes worse than the disease? Yeah, it is a question worth uh, asking because um, one psychological phenomenon that's relevant to evaluating our options is the what's known as called the identifiable victim bias. Namely, if we uh, can imagine how um, someone will be harmed by an event, if we if it has if they have a name, if they have a face, if they're in the news, we prioritize it the much more than diffuse harm, diffuse deaths from causes that may take place over a longer period of time. Uh, and that, uh, that, that's well known to people who study the psychology of risk and fear. Uh, so we fear, uh, we, we fear nuclear accidents, which kill very, very few people. But when they do, uh, they do with a, uh, all at once in a, in a way that, that makes the news. Whereas all the people killed by coal, by uh, particulate emissions, probably a million a year, doesn't register with us because we, just, you know, we don't know who they are and you can't really say that that guy died because of emphysema from breathing in uh, uh, particulates from, from coal. So likewise, in the case of a pandemic, we do have to be aware that the, with Im horrific images of um, overflowing uh, intensive care units with uh, it's so salient in our mind, you, you, you breathe in the, the, uh, the germ, it can kill you. Whereas things that kill people more slowly, like the side effects of unemployment and uh, poverty, and possibly this is uh, we're still unknown. The effects of, of social isolation are harder to uh, factor in. So uh, we have to think about it. On the other hand, balancing against uh, that the, uh, is the danger that with a pandemic, it, it's exponential. It could grow in uh, at frightening rates. And so the uh, harm, even if we, even if we at any given moment were apt to underestimate it, because it is, uh, it's not like a, a terrorist attack, but we have to keep in mind its potential. We don't yet know how to balance these two things, and and, and I think we're we're learning as this tragedy unfolds. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to turn now to. Uh, Courtney Sender, who is an alum of Harvard Divinity School. Courtney, if you can unmute yourself and your video. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you again for hosting this. Um, so I wanted to ask, I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And when this disease first struck, I was instantly willing to believe that really horrible things can happen from the government or the world. Today in the 21st century, I skipped denial and just believed it. A lot of friends without that kind of family history vehemently disagreed or disagree still. Um, so I'm wondering how you think personal, generational, or national histories of trauma affect personal and national willingness to respond to the virus. Uh, so I, I don't know the facts on whether um, having a personal history makes one. I, I believe if I understood what you said, that, that it made you uh, more willing to believe that something awful could happen? Yes, for me, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It would be inter I think it's a question that one shouldn't answer until one someone does the study and, and checks. So I, I, it might be true, but I, I'm not sure that it's true. Because uh, uh, there are um, I, and there were a lot of there were a lot of various stories uh, when the pandemic first exploded as to whether the baby boomers, because they lived through the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation, which never happened, maybe they're too complacent. Then you could tell kind of the opposite story while well, they lived with the threat of annihilation, so they're more sensitive to it. Uh, I, I would take it as a, a hypothesis that we should, uh, uh, should explore. Ideally, it shouldn't matter. Ideally, we should react to the threat according to how dangerous the threat is and base it on the 
uh, the, the data that we have on, on the uh, pandemic and not on our cultural memory. Uh, thank you. I want to turn to uh, Mark Sherman, who got his PhD in psychology at Harvard. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Also, uh, Al Bregman was a teacher of mine back in 1963-64. Uh, I know he was a teacher of yours as well. Al with, Bregman, uh, I just had a uh, Zoom Seder with Al Bregman. Fantastic. That's great to hear. My, my question is this. I find, I think, um, if, I just want to ask you about humor. I think that's been so important. I think uh, and the thing about this, um, I think humor has helped people through all kinds of crises and situations. And here it's kind of a common experience that we share. So I just want you to comment on that if you could. Yeah, that, that's really true. Humor, humor does generate a, uh, a common knowledge in a technical sense of uh, knowing something, knowing that other people knowing, know it, know that, knowing that other people know that you know that they know it. So it is a, a generator of solidarity. Uh, and so if we can laugh at the same things, it does give rise to a, a kind of fellow feeling that, that I think can be comforting and psychologically healthy. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, I want to turn to another Mark with a C. Uh, Mark Cohen uh, is a professor at UMass Boston and also the chair of the Harvard Hillel Board. Mark, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pinker. It's a real pleasure to listen to you. One of the things that has been troubling me throughout this crisis has been the inability of people who are losing loved ones to actually have the opportunity to say goodbye, to perform traditional mourning rituals, be they uh, Jewish or Christian. And I'm curious about your thinking about either long-term impacts or what, what thoughts do you have about how people can deal with that sort of grief uh, in the future to some, come to closure? Yeah, it is, it is a heartbreaking thought um, uh, on top of the tragedy of the, uh, the deaths and the suffering themselves, the, the fact that we, we don't have the communal, opportunity, communal opportunities to, to grieve, uh, to say nothing of physically being with, with a, a loved one in their, in their last moments. Um, in terms of, uh, and, and the people who are um, perishing now, uh, many of them are, probably most of them are, are being uh, interred without the communal ceremony of a, of a funeral. Uh, we will, uh, I, I think what will happen is that we will have um, uh, post, um, uh, post event memorial services, they will, uh, uh, if you lose a loved one and there's no opportunity for a funeral, I don't think we're going to let it, let it pass that, that we will have a memorial services. Um, and uh, a uh, fortunate possibility is if they are um, communally accepted as the ne a necessary response and, uh, and are given the same symbolic meaning as the original funeral and, and burial service, then that can, uh, I think that can relieve some of the, the pain of not publicly marking such a uh, traumatic existential event. Uh, the, the idea of, of saying goodbye to someone at a funeral is, is uh, um, deeply upsetting, um, not just because of actually having it at the time, but because we feel that any, every one of our major emotions has to be, be ratified by our community. And the, the various uh, Jewish rituals surrounding um, death and, uh, and burial are, are ways of not just immediately comforting the, uh, the hurting, but by, by making it social, by making it uh, kind of a, a ratified ritual, that's what you do, then it, um, it relieves you of the burden of have I, have I shown the, the proper respect for the deceased? Have I made it clear to the community what it means to them, what the person meant to them, what they meant to me? And if we arrive at some new, because we're gonna to have to invent it, new form of um, after the fact memorial service, uh, I hope that that would ease some, some of the pain that will be uh, otherwise unavoidable. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, I'm gonna read a question to you from uh, my colleague, our clergy intern, Avital Habshush. She asks, have you noticed any acts during this pandemic that demonstrate the better angels of our nature? Do you think this will be a time period that will strengthen this, put this to the test? 
Oh, unquestionably. Uh, and beginning with the, uh, the, the public health experts who are um, uh, trying to understand it and uh, discover the, uh, the, the responses that could literally save millions of lives. Um, so th that by far is the, uh, the, the most hopeful, the most praiseworthy response. But then the, uh, the, the healthcare workers who are risking their own lives and, and uh, health and uh, contact with loved ones to deal with the sick. Um, there's a, a tremendous sacrifices that they have made that are some, some of them are doing their job, but, but most of them are going beyond the call of duty in, in a way that's truly inspiring. Uh, there are the, the people who are simply doing their jobs, working at the post offices and the supermarkets and uh, the, the, the firefighters and um, police officers that, uh, that, that are not going on strike. They're not using it as an opportunity to press for a, an advantage, but they are showing up at personal cost and danger. Uh, they're the people who are uh, respecting the public health measures, such as the, the social distancing, often at a, at a great personal sacrifice. Then there are the small measures, the, uh, the, 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 the humor, the posting of teddy bears in windows for children to spot on walks with their parents, the uh, viral, if you'll pardon the expression, performance of the uh, Israel Philharmonic, of the uh, Passover songs that I'm sure many of you have seen on social media, the um, uh, the, the, the concert in, to the, an empty concert hall in um, Milan uh, by, uh, by, by opera singers, uh, all the ways in which we, uh, even if we can't save lives, we try to make life as bearable as we can. Uh, thank you. I want to turn to uh, Suzanne Klingenstein. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Suzanne, if you can uh, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for um, taking my call. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, you. fabulous. Um, so I was wondering if uh, the pandemic had a really deep personal impact on you. Are there things that you will be doing differently in the future? So for me, for example, it would be, I am now talking to my mom daily. Uh, she is living in Germany. So I have finally gotten her to use FaceTime with me and to really talk with me, like you said, it's not the same as panim al panim, but at least I can talk to her uh, via Zoom or via FaceTime. Will there be something that you will be doing differently in, for yourself once well, this might uh, be over or doing something already that is different and that could maybe also help us? Well, uh, I, I too have been speaking daily to, to uh, my mother who is with us uh, this evening, Rosalind Pinker. Uh, and uh, and uh, I've been concerned with with my family, with my my loved ones, with my friends, and uh, um, I hope it wouldn't take a pandemic to uh, do what ought to be done anyway. But uh, but 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 uh, it almost certainly will. Uh, Would there be something I, in your teaching that you might do differently? Well, I um, I uh, made a course correction in the course that I'm teaching now, a general education course called Rationality where I devoted a, a lecture to uh, application of rationality to understand our current predicament and the role of uh, cognitive fallacies and biases in, in uh, encouraging us perhaps to misunderstand it. So I, I wrote a lecture from, from scratch. Uh, and um, no doubt they'll continue, there will continue to be allusions to the uh, pandemic in uh, uh, lectures going forward. Uh, I'm encouraging students who have to pick a final capstone project on major global issues to consider pandemic preparedness as a, uh, as a global uh, issue. And I hope that with the fantastic uh, talent and dedication of uh, Harvard undergraduates that uh, some of that will be channeled to a, uh, a cause that could result in the saving of million, millions of lives. Uh, and I will be, uh, I, I'm often asked to comment on um, prospects for the future on risks and, and opportunities. And even though I had a discussion of pandemics in my last book, uh, Enlightenment Now, and, and uh, a comment, uh, I think fairly perfunctory that we're not adequately prepared for, for pandemics. Um, certainly in my public commentary going forward, I will be more um, uh, conscious and, and cognizant of the uh, ever-present threat of pandemics. 
Thank you. Uh, I've got one uh, written in here from Mishi Harman, who's a former student oh. of yours. Uh, and he writes that you mentioned globalism and ultranationalism or xenophobia. This pandemic seems to have heightened both. In which direction do you imagine we will swing following the pandemic? Ah, great question. And uh, they, I, I think you nailed it by identifying the two forces that are, uh, are engaged in a tug of war, which is exactly what, what makes prediction difficult. Uh, on the one hand, if you're going to uh, lay out what ought we to do, what should the response be, it would clearly be greater global cooperation. The opposite um, uh, prediction that uh, this is going to slow down globalization because people are going to be afraid of uh, transmitting diseases that emerge in one place to other places. I think it's very unlikely just because there's so many forces pushing toward globalization that uh, once this gets under control, it's uh, highly unlikely that they'll be reversed. Uh, trade is not going to stop. It's just uh, too enmeshed in the modern economy. Uh, students are not going to want to stop uh, studying abroad, traveling abroad. Tourism is going to cease. Uh, problems like climate change and um, uh, dark money and cyber uh, sabotage, which are inherently global, are not going to go away. So the forces pushing toward globalization are still going to be in place. Uh, of the two uh, aspects of globalization that bear on pandemics, namely easier to spread but more necessary to cooperate, uh, which will prevail is uh, sadly hard to predict. What ought to prevail is greater cooperation. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, Professor Pinker, I really want to thank you for being so gracious with your time uh, and with your wisdom. Depending on how long this lasts, we may have to have you on again to give some tips on uh, on our hair. I think it's only been a couple <laughs> of weeks, and I already don't really know what I'm doing. But I think you could give us, uh, you know, some some good instruction there. Uh, but I want to thank you again. I want to thank everyone for joining. A reminder to undergrads: you should have received an email about our matzo pizza making and uh, Prince of Egypt screening starting right now. So you'll have the link to that. And to everyone else, uh, upcoming sessions in this series will include Harvard historian Jill Lepore and Professor Emeritus uh, Ruth Weiss. Uh, so look forward to the specific timing on those. And once again, uh, Professor Pinker, one of the things we lack uh, on Zoom is uh, the sound of applause. And I watched Saturday Night Live a little bit last night and it felt a little bit different. So I'm sure you're used to hearing some applause after a session like this. Uh, it exists, even if uh, not quite audible. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. And I wish you good health and a happy Passover to you and to everyone on the call. And I, I uh, send those wishes to everyone participating, everyone listening, the Harvard community and, and beyond. And I thank Harvard Hillel and I thank you Rabbi Passover for, for uh, making this possible. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Lala Tov, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Lala Tov.